A warm welcome to the ADC 17, whether you are here in person or looking or watching the video afterwards. My name is Matthias Krebs, I'm from Germany, and um, this panel is intended to provide an overview of the status quo of the usage of mobile music apps. And um, with our panelists, we want to make a lively discussion about this topic. Um, what is the experience of um, yeah, some guys who are really involved into this topic uh, in the music industry? And we want to challenge pro audio developers here um, with thought-provoking ideas of about music creation apps. Um, I'm really excited to discuss this topic um, of this new world from a perspective of a researcher and an app musician uh, operating with mobile, this mobile music apps for years now. And, and this, this topic has involved so much because in 29 or in 28, when the first mobile apps we will see later on um, arrived on, on smartphones and tablets, um, we have only these experimental apps. There are some music technologists who invented some new ways of making music with apps, but up to today, there are a lot of music creation apps. So we have about 100 or 10 thousands of music apps uh, in the app stores for Android and iOS. And um, this is, there are some oriented on instrument and traditional instruments, but there are also a lot of very innovative musical apps. We will hand also this uh, later. And uh, yeah, so we have a very uh, wide bandwidth um, between in, in the kind of users and their experience and also, uh, also in their approach they are doing. Um, we will have today here in discussion. Uh, in the beginning, we will start with a brief introduction of our panelists, and after that, we have 20 minutes for the discussion. And then, it's your turn. Uh, we have another 20 minutes for questions from your side, and so we want to get into this topic more and more deeply. Yeah. So I will start with Jeannie. Can you okay. introduce yourself? Uh, so my name is Jeannie. I work at Smule, and so Maybe some of you have heard of Smil from yesterday's keynote. I would say that Smil's mission from the beginning that definitely was what attracted me and the passion about it is the belief that everybody is creative and that everybody could be creative through audio and then to connect people um, together through this music that they create together. And the philosophy has always been how do we lower the barrier of intimidation for people who, who aren't experienced making music and actually see it as a very intimidating thing. But how do we lower that intimidation barrier for them so that they can experience that joy of making music together? And um, I think one of the quotes that Gu, uh, the early co-founder, has said is that actually we're, we want to do a benign, uh, what, what do we call it, benign mind tricks on people to convince them to how, whatever we can do to get them to play and then all of a sudden go, oh, they're making music, they're, um, they're actually part of it. And um, I think part of that is really to believe that music is the original social network and how do we bring music back to its original roots where you're participating, you're collaborating, you're not just um, you know, sitting back passively listening, you're actually part of it. And so that's, that's a quick blurb about Smeo. Uh, I'll Thank just you. do a really quick blurb about me. I'm, I'm in the product management design. My background is actually in engineering as a first life, and um, for the last eight years, I was the um, product managing designer as well. So, thank you for being here, yeah. Ashley. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Ashley Elston. I have been writing about uh, mobile music apps uh, since 2006. Um, so before the iPhone, before the iPad, before any of those things arrived, uh, I've been talking about everything and everything since then. Um, at a blog called Palm Sounds. Uh, I recently moved my writing uh, to create digital music uh, about four months ago. Um, and I'm also involved with uh, some charities who work in accessibility for digital music making, that's Heart and Soul and Drake Music, and with some startups in the music tech scene as well. Thank you. And now the guy in the black chair. <laughs> <laughs> the evil chair. Evil. Um, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Derbyshire. I work as part of an innovation team based in Tar Yard in London called Amplify. And that innovation team was formed from well-known brands Focusrite and Novation. Uh, why have we set up an innovation team? Well, we, we made an app a few years ago that became very successful. And for us, as a traditional maker of um, music equipment, it was quite new for us as a company. It's a 25-year-old company. So we decided to take that team out of the main company and form a completely separate team to focus on making apps. And the apps that we make uh, are Launchpad, Bloxwave, and Groovebox for remixing, starting new ideas, and making beats and synths. Um, so yeah, that's me. Yeah, fine. Thank you. And we have Karim. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karim Morski. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Algorithm. And we founded the company in 2006 and originally brought out the first versions for Mac exclusively. And our vision always was to turn music listeners into you know, creative artists that can interact with their music. And we found that back then, there were a lot of tools to listen to your digital audio files. But we wanted to bridge that gap between music listening and creativity with music. So we, we created DJ um, and wanted people to basically be able to DJ um, with our app. And then when um, the iPad was introduced, we saw a major opportunity because now there was this whole layer of, or this level of indirection between software and the user was basically removed through touchscreen interaction. And ever since, um, you know, we had, we had a massive breakthrough on the App Store with over 30 million downloads then. And I think we turned a lot of ordinary music listeners into DJs. So we're very excited about, you know, this development and how things are changing so rapidly in the mobile space. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want now to start the discussion. And the first part uh, is about how I... Who are the users of music apps? And I want to start with you, Jimmy. And it's about you, yesterday in your keynote, you already talked about uh, the users, but I want to know it more in depth. Um, how would you define the users of your music apps um, in terms of music experience and maybe also technologic experience? It, does this matter? Ah, so. So the users of our apps, and I'll just focus mostly on Sim because I think it and we've had many apps and really the demographic is, is different per app, but I think Sim is probably the most global. In general, um, their music experience or their music background, and this is anecdotal, we don't have, a, a, we don't have actual you know, hard data on this, uh -huh. but in general, I, I believe people don't actually have a lot of the musical experience. And anecdotally, um, people talk a lot about they found this because and they've used it, they're used to sing maybe when they're in elementary school or high school and they really stop you know, when they're adult and now they found this again and it's really rediscovering a passion for, for singing aspects. So in terms of music background, most people don't have a lot of the formal training in that, in that aspect and so. I want to specify the question uh, to, to the app sing mm -hmm. um, and to ask you um, um, how do the users actually use this app in, in terms of period, depth, engagement, and how, how do they use it? Have you any? So for, uh, well, Sing on its own, it's, uh, it's a, at the core of it, um, it's a karaoke app. So people get it to, to sort of sing the songs. And so they open it, they search through a songbook for a song they want to sing, and they kind of go, go through that. So that's, that's their most usage case. Um, I think it's generally it starts off fairly casual. Um, mm -hmm. Fairly much more like you know they want to engage in it in terms of marketing. We we encourage them to sing with our. We have a partner artist program, so we do see a lot of new users come in because they want to sing with Charlie Puth, or um, we get a good partner artist that kind of draws people into. And for them, it's like oh my gosh, I could sing with my favorite artist. They don't even at that point they don't even think they're, you know, doing karaoke. But, and you yeah. have this community approach, yeah. and how how is this managed? So the people come again and meet friends and are communicating? Yeah, so um, the core of it is that um, we're singing, what we realize is that pot potentially one of the barriers to get over singing is if you're not singing alone, you're singing with other people. Um, a lot of people are just background singers in the room. So the concept is like you, you come on and you find someone to sing with. And actually that's the part, you select a song and then you select someone to sing with. If you, it's the, that's the free model. So they could see, you could sing with anyone for free across the world. 
And so generally the first person who would lay down the first part um, or part one or part two, whichever one they sing, and the users come in, they choose, no, they, they choose to find someone, we'll recommend them people, recommend aspects. And through that, they start forming stronger bonds and connections, they start making friends as, as they see those connections, and that's how we see the network form. Interestingly enough, very early on, we definitely found out that people come on to Smeal and they form a different network, because they don't necessarily, they're kind of like, oh, I don't want to tell my friends I'm using this. <laughs> and so they're like, I'm not going to see with my friends. So they actually were much more comfortable seeing with strangers uh, initially, and then getting more confidence and to then go to. So they actually form a new network of new friends, because they were definitely much more comfortable <laughs> not, um, not sharing with their real life friends about it. And, um, yeah. Seeing with someone across the world. So we find here so, so so a lot of social aspects of making music together. Now we come to Ashley. Ashley uh, is involved in several projects uh, in the field of mobile music, and he is also involved in communication to more experienced users of musical apps. Um, yeah, what can you tell us about um, the places where they talk? What are the problems of pro audio music uh, users? Um, well, it, it's an interesting question. I think, I mean, if we go back to when we, 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 we spoke about the very early days of the App Store and iOS, and I think a lot of those apps were, uh, you know, rightly um, deemed as toys, mm -hmm. um, but very rapidly apps have evolved um, in the past uh, decade to, uh, in some cases, um, being equivalent to, to desktop applications. I mean, if you look at applications like Aria, which is you know, a fully featured door with plugins and everything that you would expect, that will run on an iPad. Um, and users are taking apps like that, using Audio Unit V3 plugins, and creating albums and creating music that it is very, very hard to tell the difference between whether it was produced in a studio or a home studio or on a laptop or on an iPad. Um, and I think whilst there might be a, a perception that mobile music is, is still you know, toys, fun, uh, I think the reality is that the, 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 um, the industry has moved on in leaps and bounds, especially in the last few years, um, to a position where if, if a user wants to pick up um, tools which are typically a fraction of the cost of the equivalents on a mm -hmm. desktop, they can get up and running and be producing high quality music very, very simply. Yeah, you have, you have really to have in mind that um, even with an iPad <coughs> 2 that was in t uh, 2011, uh, one can put in uh, in hard uh, uh, software, uh, uh, you can record up to 20, uh, 20 tracks side by side mm. in, in a recording uh, in, in, in high quality. Yeah. Uh, and, and now it develops and develops every year and you now you can really put your, your whole studio on an mm. iPad and record a, a whole album with this. And yeah, and, it, and it's been done. Yeah. It's been done and there are high profile artists. I mean, the one that immediately comes to mind is um, Elvis Costello recorded an album on an iPad, mm -hmm. um, which was a bunch of beautiful songs. Um, and I think the question needs to flip from, you know, can you produce great music using an iPad to can you produce a great album and does it really matter whether it was recorded on an iPad or in a studio? And the context changes. It's yeah. not only the studio um, where, the mu uh, where the musicians make their music, mm. produce their music, and they only make it in the fields, in the buses, in the trains, mm. and so on. Have you any more? Well, I mean, it's a really interesting point because um, one of the things that, that happened a lot, probably in, in the early days of the App Store, is I would constantly get emails from people saying, thanks for telling me about this app. I used to make music when, you know, before I had kids, before I had, you know, a really intensive job, and now I realize that I can do all of the stuff that I used to do in my home studio, which would take hours to set up, and I can do it on my iPhone, and that's brilliant. Um, so you, it, I think it's kind of facilitated a wave of people coming back into music production. I mean, it, it's interesting what you say, Jeannie, about your users, and I, I'd really like to see them you know, taking a progression from, mm -hmm. from seeing and, and, and moving through kind of the, the spectrum of music apps and, and moving forward. But I think a lot of the time, and th this is a benefit and a problem with, with um, the current state of music apps, is a lot of the apps that we have today are very technical. They require a, a degree of understanding mm -hmm. of music technology that is prohibitive to, to new users. Um, 
And, and whilst that's great for a lot of people who understand what a digital audio workstation is, uh, for a lot of users, it doesn't make any sense to them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the, the current state is, is pretty amazing. I mean, you talked about you know, having 20 tracks on, a, on an iPad 2. Yeah, um, an iPad Pro, you can quite happily have 48 tracks with multiple plugins. Mm. And you kind of question, well, I could do that on my desktop, or I could do it while I'm on the go, wherever I happen to be. And that, that is a huge benefit. Yeah. But uh, the music software and uh, hardware industry is still at large um, focused on the desktop applications. Mm. Uh, Matt, you are from the uh, hardware side a little bit. Um, you, you started in innovation. How did you make your journey to the music app production now? Well, for us, it was, uh, it was a very new experience, I think. So um, in 2007, 2008, um, Novation partnered with uh, Ableton and we made a product called uh, the Launchpad. And that piece of hardware uh, became a huge success for us as a company. And um, we learned a lot through that experience. Uh, actually, I've seen the Freedom in Zeal as well, actually. We, we worked with Freedom at the time, <laughs> if I remember right. Um, we, we learned that actually um, Launchpad solved more problems than when we first thought. It was so accessible and it was so immediate to play with that actually the problem then became how do they then take that piece of hardware format, that these, these clips, these grids, these buttons, and how do we make it even more accessible to even more people? Um, Ableton is an incredible piece of software, and we were thrilled to work with them. But we soon realized that even that was too complicated for a lot of the people that we were engaging with. So we decided that uh, one way to do that was just to create an app and make it free and accessible for anyone to use. Um, and that actually reduced so many barriers that some of our users thought it was a game. <laughs> and we, uh, I remember uh, Zini saying yesterday, oh, quick, there's a problem. Let's stop it being a game. Well, actually, they loved it being a game. So we said, let's make it more like a game. And actually, so for me, in my journey of coming from making quite sophisticated pieces of technology and synthesizers, to turning my world up 180 degrees and thinking about people using this thing like a game was actually the way forward. It wasn't the thing you should stop, it was the thing you should embrace. And um, so really, since then, transforming the concept of people making music from hardware to software has been our mission and our journey. And trying to gain empathy for these very different customers has been, um, and still is, our goal. Mm -hmm. uh, to truly try and understand what they really want, which isn't probably what most of us here want. <laughs> hey, Karim, can you attest this huge impact uh, of this easy to assess mobile apps um, for, for listeners to get into yeah, music creators? Yeah, absolutely. Um, with, with your app, you really give us a, give a step into this world from as a DJ, as a listener, as someone who loves a music and now it's to, yeah, to curate musical pieces and to make something new? Exactly, because we, like the transition is like very seamless because our app from the outside, the interface is very simple and, and easy to use. So they can just use it like a simple player. And in fact, a lot of users start with that. They just like the turntable animations mm. um, and the deck. So they just use it as a standalone player sometimes. But then the switch from, you know, playing, um, pressing play, pause, to like mixing two tracks is um, very easy. And that's how a lot of our users turn into DJs where they never really thought they had ambitions to be that. I mean, that's what we're hearing all the time from users. They say um, they're now, they're, they're having paid gigs like weekly now and they never thought they would be able um, to do that. But, but you are also partnering um, with hard, hardware companies. Um, what role do music apps play in this, this thing between to, 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 yeah, to sell hardware? Is there any role for music apps? Yes, yeah, so, so for us, from the beginning, we, we thought having a, a strong hardware ecosystem and a strategy with, mm -hmm. with hardware is, is very important, especially if you want to have the full spe spectrum of users. So of course, we have those beginner users that they don't even know what DJ hardware really is and they're glad they don't have to, to deal with it because it's intimidating and complex. But there are also um, existing you know, professional DJs and they're all using iPads and iPhones. So um, how can we make their way of mixing and you know, the tactile experience 
be compatible with their mobile devices that they're using. So that's why we also never really saw the thing like this desktop versus mobile. Like we think you can actually combine the best of both worlds. And nowadays, you know, DJs or musicians, they usually have a computer and they have a mobile device. So I think as a developer, it's, it's you know, our challenge that we have to take is how can we make the best possible experience for these users on each device? So when they close their laptop and they, they go on a train, how can they continue uh, being immersed in the whole experience? So um, when, when we design the app now, we, we never really design it for a single product. It's more like we think of the overall ecosystem. How can we make the apps talk to each other and, and how can we cater to the different use cases? Yeah. From uh, discussing the current state, uh, we now want to come to the next part uh, and to discuss some questions about the future. Um, Jeannie, what do you think? Um, how will this world of making music with apps in your field develop in the future? Is it more about communication? Is it they really make music or? Yeah, that's it's actually interesting because um, one of the questions that, that we get is a lot of users are seeing covers. Are they are they actually making music? Are they are they musicians? Are they artists? How do they um, do they you know is it that the standard of making music is that it has to be original music before they could be you know seeing themselves as that? I, I think that's actually an interesting question. I think um, for us and at least from my perspective, the fact that they were able to record a tune, if anything, they should qualify them as, as this is music um, and they're recording, uh, it's a song. You know, whether it's a cover or not, it's our song, it's, it's their song, it's theirs. Um, and I, so I'm not sure if I'm going off track on a question, that aspect of it, I guess um, what I would say is maybe the perspective isn't necessarily, um, I think there's a standard that people think you're a musician, you need to be a pop star, you need to be at that celebrity level, you need to, you know, have all this stuff. And I think, um, at least from my perspective, from a smear, if we could get that user to even feel like, oh, here's a set of my recordings with my friends and just feeling good about it. I mean, we're not, you know, you don't have to be, you know, a number one on the top charts to be like, you made music, you had apps. Like, if we could actually promote everybody to feel a little bit empowered that way, then, you, then you'll start bubbling up and then people will start being inspired to do more. Yeah, being inspired and reducing barriers. This is also your topic. Um, you are also in the uh, first front uh, in, in, in new context uh, with your projects like uh, Heart and Soul. Can mm -hmm. you explain something about this? Well, yeah, sorry. It was what Jeannie was saying about, you uh -huh. know, do people identify themselves as, as artists? And it reminded me of a story um, that uh, I, I, was, I was working with a group of um, disabled artists and I sat with a young man who had very, very limited communication. Um, and he came into to a workshop that we were running and had never um, done anything musical before. And actually sat down in front of an iPad, which was running Launchpad. Um, and I didn't plan that, by the way. That was just by accident. <laughs> and I, I sat with him and started showing him how to use Launchpad. Um, and he, he was kind of nervous and he had never done this before. And we sat there for two hours and did not take a break. Um, and every time he seemed to be l losing interest, I'd show him something else, like show him how to use the filter or how to pan stuff. And it would re-engage him. And after two hours, this young man was physically different. He was standing up straight, bouncing up and down, full of enthusiasm. And it, it comes back to something that I think maybe your users get a lot from, from, what, from, from your app. And it's a sense of joy from creating music. Um, and whether you want to call yourself an artist or, or a musician or whatever, the, the primary function for me is to get a sense of joy from what you're doing. Now, uh, I, I think in terms of the world of apps and uh, mobile development, uh, I think it is incumbent on, on all of us here to try and help users to experience that feeling of joy by creating something, whether it's singing a cover, whether it's creating some beats, whatever it is that they want to do by getting up to speed really quickly. And I think the challenge for the industry is to be able to say to someone who is a complete novice user and who has never um, touched a musical instrument physically or digitally, 
to be able to make something really quickly and experience the joy of doing that and feel proud of what they're doing. Yeah. Now, essentially, to do that, the technology has to disappear. Yeah, and but it, it's not essential. But is it not a challenge? Mm -hmm. Then you have only, yeah, not only, but, but then you have a crowd of people who have no musical experience and now get involved into making music. But what, what about the pro audio hardware? Well, I, I think this is the start of a journey. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, you, you, we have a spectrum of music, to, um, digital music tools, you know, whether it's on mobile or desktop, uh, you have a very, very wide spectrum from very simple things um, that, that anyone can create with to very, very complex software um, that you know, requires a, a, quite a, a detailed degree of understanding and learning. Um, and I think where people start, they might you know, get into an app like Launchpad, for example, and really enjoy doing something with that, something that brings them some joy. What we don't do is take them on a journey that helps them develop further. Yeah, and this is a topic of Matt, uh, to, to getting the people in on this journey. And mm. uh, they start with Launchpad, for example, but also um, with apps like Blockswave. You have mm. the first screen with this flourish starting screen, and you just put some colors one after another, and then you get new screens, and you are get more and more deeply into uh, the creative part of music. You, you can remix things, and you can record your own um, sounds, and so on. What is this for a strategy for, for a company like yours to, to, to get more into the experienced part of making music? Because we also want to have more, more than yeah, just this thing of getting uh, uh, some music out of it, more into this really um, complex things. Yes, that connects to um, the journey, uh, the start of the journey that Ashley talked about. Mm -hmm. They have this two hours of fun. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, for me, when I started to learn an instrument, it wasn't fun. It was, <laughs> it was super painful. And um, I'm and on two, two <laughs> sides of this argument about whether music should be kept as this precious thing that we go, oh, but it's really sacred. You, you can't do You have to take the Royal Associated Board, otherwise that's it. Um, I think I'm very much more on the side now. Of if we can get as many people to enjoy the experience and have fun with music making, it'll happen from there. And, and then the question for probably all of us is, um, how do we take them on that journey? How complicated is it? What's the best way of holding this person's hand and giving them every opportunity to progress on this musical journey? And so for us, uh, the apps that we've made uh, represent uh, what we term, um, we call them humps. There's like 10 humps to get over. We're only on about hump three right now. <laughs> but each one is like a mountain that these users are climbing. And if they get to the top and they don't get some kind of reward, they're going to slip back down rather than go over to the next hump. Um, and really holding their hand through every step of this experience is something we're attempting to do. We've certainly failed in a few areas. We've probably made a few gains in other areas, but we're trying to then take them through. How far we can take them, I'm not entirely sure, but we're we're going to do our best to um, get them as far as possible. But actually, you are also a musician right now, and uh, Karim is a musician too. You are working as a DJ. Um, how does your app help you in your day job or in, in your job as a DJ on stage? Are you really using your app that is used by some not so experienced? Is it also ex uh, used by very experienced users like you? Yes. So I mean, this was always the goal that. So one app for everyone. Yes. Uh huh. And and we think it? that's possible. So. One of the co-founders was not a DJ at all. I was uh -huh. a, a professional DJ when we started. And so when we set out, we always said, okay, I eventually I want to be able to use this in a club instead of like the bulky equipment. And he wanted to be able to DJ with this. And he thought the existing equipment was way too complex. So we wanted to build something that's accessible to a consumer, but appealing to a professional. And I, I totally think that's possible, even when we think about a piano. So I, I started playing the piano when I was little. And eventually I got better, and over the years, and it was still the exact same interface, whether I was five years old playing it or when I was 20 being, being a professional artist. So we think the same is possible with software, especially on mobile devices, is you create something um, that is instantly approachable, but then it gets more complex you know, with different means. So um, we want to build a single tool um, for everyone, yes.
Okay, and uh, this is also an approach you are doing by then combining your app with uh, Ableton, for example. Um, also, um, I want to ask Matt, because you have also this uh, possibility to, to, to load the sessions then on Ableton Live and to get more complex into the details. Um, what is the strategy behind this? Well, Ableton have, um, have created a system that allows um, various partners to export into their program which is great. Uh, I think uh, it's an exemplar for how I think collaborations could work between companies. Um, what, what we have really decided is once that uh, user declares themselves as quite advanced, then we would like them to go to Ableton because we think they'll have a great time. For us, um, we still have a few humps left to go before <laughs> we can make them happy. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, I think we just want them to have a great time, so we should do everything possible to guide them. And if sending them to someone like Ableton is the right thing, then we should do that. But the, but the cool thing is uh, your apps that really, um, you can really jump into and make music that also have um, functionality like Ableton Link to, to provide an, uh, the functionality to have more than one iPad and to hook up even with hardware and uh, Ableton live uh, computers and so on and with other programs and software and so on. So. Um, how does this combine? Because you said uh, we had the first three hums, and now we have this Ableton uh, in a professional um, perspective. Um, how, how, how to bridge that gap between um, very easy to, to work with musical apps and then with this professional stuff? I, I honestly think they're going to meet in the middle. Uh -huh. like, uh, an amazing pieces of software like Ableton and NI will probably start coming down and probably meet the likes of us coming up Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and, and I'm how, not sure how's going to happen, but it sounds like fun. Uh, um. how, how to come there? Maybe it's a community? Um, or, uh, Ashley, you are very much into the community or in, in, in the wide field. How do they um, communicate? Uh, what are the questions they have? And how, how to deep? Well, I, I think it very much depends on the user, because uh -huh. um, yeah, as Matt says, yeah, to, to get over that first hump, you know, if someone's got no experience, it's a really, really tough thing. And if they pick the wrong place to start, God help them, they're, they're in trouble. Because if, yeah, there are apps that they can pick up uh, which require a degree of knowledge that no one's going to have. I mean, you know, there are apps out there that, that you know, pretend to be easy to use that then talk about you know, applying a VCF to something. And most users are going to say, I have no idea, or or willingness to find out what that is. Um, if they come in at the right point, I think there is a continuum that, that we can take people down. And I think, you know, as Matt says again, if someone gets to a point and says, yeah, actually, I want to jump out and, and start playing with live, great, fantastic. Um, if they want to do that, that learning, if they want to go there, that's just brilliant. A lot of users are going to take a slower journey. And you know, for, for plenty of people, they're going to start in Launchpad, they're going to start in other apps and go, you know what, that was brilliant fun, that's it for me. And, and we need to be able to cater for so many different types of user. Because for some people, you know, it, it is just fun. For other people, they want to go the whole way, learn everything, and you know, get really into creative production, which is fantastic. One, one last question, and then we come to you, um, about the results um, you have after your, uh, with your production. Um, the, your users are singing to an iPhone. <laughs> And, and what, are, what, what role has the product at the end? Do they, what do they do with this, with their singing? So they could choose to, uh, so we provide audio filters. Uh, so they could choose what kind of audio filters to apply to it. And uh, video effects, so they could choose like, you know, whether they want black and white aspect. But that's essentially it. They upload a part and um, I call that we have like a global recording studio in the cloud for the user. We do all the rendering, like we do, we do all the um, audio adjustments to render the audio tracks together to make sure the volume balance, noise, and all that aspect apply it. And then we do all the video transitions to create that vi final video recording. So every time someone joins, if it's a group recording, we re-render it with that new person um, and those aspects. So for the user, it's, um, it's really very easy. And actually, it's an interesting question as you kind of give people along the journey, because we let me see where this is sort of the challenge we have. We have new users who just want that uh, easy push, push button. But as our users are getting more and more proficient, they're having more and more fun, 
and they're getting more and more involved, we're getting users who now want more controls. And they're asking us, oh, could we have, you know, for group, you know, I really want to be able to edit various things. So we do have some audio filters where they could adjust some of the sliders um, for the more advanced people that want to do that. But it's one of the things that we're going, well, how do we also address our growing community as they're experiencing more? And definitely it's always great when they go off and, you know, explore other aspects on their own. And, uh, that's a good problem to have, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> when we're trying to balance how do we get a new users engaged because we don't want to complicate an interface, but how do we still have that thing that, that um, continuously engages the users? Right. They want to get more, they want to understand now more what's going on in the audio and the video. Right. They now want to be more in control of it. So. And we have also at, at your app a lot of mixes then now from, from DJs and um, how, how, how does the results then look like and where are they published? So how they look like, I mean, they can record their mixes uh -huh. in, in real time mm -hmm. and they can use it if they go to the gym or something, just let it run or uh -huh. obviously the sharing aspect I think is, is a legal challenge, uh -huh. which isn't quite solved yet. But yeah, DJs tend to not care so much about those questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, I hope um, that gives, has given you a, a little insight into this topic. Um, maybe you have some questions, now we have time for that, um, about your experience as developers. Um, what challenges do you see? Any questions? Questions? No? All right, sorry. So regarding uh, Smule, one time I was very excited because I noticed that one of the filters that could be applied to the voice would make the singer sound like they were on the stage of the San Francisco uh, opera. And I was curious, more generally, what do you think about classical music on these apps? Uh, like, how do classical musicians or students respond to digital uh, audio and apps in general? Well, that's actually, we actually have partnered with the San Francisco Opera. I don't know if it's considered classic, where the, we had the opera singer and they actually join, other people join it. It's, it's not as broad, but the music, um, the music ranges on, on Smeal is, is whatever the community desires or, or wants to, to add to it. So it's, it's actually crazy. There's actually lots of opera singers actually on the app that um, really enjoy singing with this SF opera. It's not going to be as broad. Uh, it's not going to be the most popular. Uh, in that sense, but uh, you could find, I think people could find their music interests as much. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Okay. I have another question from Don. Hi. Uh, there's been a few mentions of mobile devices um, so far in, in the panel, which are iPad, iPhone. <laughs> what can Android do to become a better platform for musical creativity? <laughs> uh, Reduce latency. <laughs> but but, but the, actually, uh, six milliseconds. Yeah, Please. maybe. <laughs> but 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 there are now really a bunch of musical apps on Android because this also develops. Uh, for example, um, um, yeah, which one? For example, uh, Caustic. rhythm. Hmm? Caustic. Caustic. Yeah. Oh. And uh, yeah, and they also in have now media insight and you can combine something. Also, there are some apps with Ableton Link, so you can really group up with people who have Android devices. I, I, I think one of the, one of the big problems um, with Android is it has been lagging behind for a very long time. Um, so it hasn't been the platform of choice uh, for anyone who wants to make it, you know, trying to not use the term serious audio um, app because I don't like it, but um, I, I just think, you know, that there are some really, really good apps um, for making music in Android, but it is a very, very small um, group uh, of, of apps compared to, to what's on iOS. And from, well, from my experience talking to developers, it's much more difficult. Um, there, are, there are a handful of developers um, who make cross-platform apps, and some of those are absolutely brilliant, but it's it's just not been the the you know, the platform of choice, unfortunately. I would love to see it grow. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
very interesting uh, discussion. Um, kind of addressing um, Matt's um, uh, saying the humps that you mm -hmm. want to get over um, to, to get to your 10 hump uh, <laughs> point, your goal. Um, at the moment, do you, uh, do you kind of feel that it's, is it platform limitations that are holding you back from, from those, or is it just man hours, just the amount of stuff you want to get done? I, I think it's actually, um, going back to a word I used earlier, it's probably um, us as the makers realizing true empathy for our customers. Um, I, I'm putting myself mostly there in that I have to eradicate huge parts of my knowledge and experience to try and get back to a place where um, we as a group can see clearly those challenges and try and solve them uniquely rather than adding more features for ourselves. Um, so I think it's more about approach to answer your, your question, and I think there's a lot we can learn from Smule. Um, I think uh, DJ as well is, uh, you know, you can open it up and just scratch for at least an hour, can't you, before you even press play? Yeah, I think that's what I did. Um, and I think in terms of those humps, um, the, 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 the chasm is huge between that first starting point and the first point of even using the word door, which is banned, I think, where we are right now. Um, it's just a huge journey. And then once you get into the world of doors, it's kind of smaller steps, I see them. So I think, um, yeah, to answer your question, it's more about approach and how we can tackle those unique challenges and learn from companies like Smule, who take uh, a really um, analytical and insightful approach to uh, tackling those problems. And, and what we learned also from Smule, the users find their own ways uh, to, to, to hump to hump. Because, uh, on, uh, for example, on, on the iOS platform, you can also combine a lot of apps. So you build your own instruments for making your music and to challenge you with, with, with all the things you can do and, and to make something new. So, uh, for example, um, the apps from Amplify have the possibility to export the things you have done in a way on the, in the one app to the other app and then to put them. And uh, with, for example, uh, Audiobus or Universal Audio, uh -huh. you can also put a chain of up to 12 apps together to play something on a, on a, uh, on a yeah, certain um, play field, and then you can record in another app and you have effects uh, through it, so you can really plan what, what can I play, how fast am I, and, and which support do I need by other apps, and which sound I want to play. So you really have your, you can hump one after another. <laughs> yeah, um, well just to, because Matt and I were talking about this earlier, I'd be curious what the other panelists think. I, I think for, for us and what I've realized is that users, I'm, because I'm in this way, they're, they're just incredibly harsh judges of themselves. And when that initial experience, it's, it's critical. The number one question in their head isn't even whether they're good or bad, or in the, because their assumption is that they're not good. So it's the number one question is, is it right or wrong? And, and I think maybe what we're trying to do with creative expression, maybe there is no right or wrong, but for the beginning user, that is the number one question. It's like, am I doing this right? Am I, am I you know, if they're not even, because they're just assumed that they're not good. And then it's developing slowly that confidence to them even be able to judge or be okay with what they but just, I, yeah. yeah. I, 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 that, that really resonates because one of the things that, that we found at Heart and Soul, um, especially when running events for the public, is if you put a keyboard in front of people, they will say, oh, I can't play, and they won't touch it. And uh, actually, lots of people say, no, I, I can't do that. I'll break it if I touch it. And that they are that averse to actually getting near an, a musical instrument. Um, and we had um, an instrument called an Alpha Sphere. Has anyone used an Alpha Sphere before? It looks like a football um, with a bunch of pads on it. It's something you know from like a 70s science fiction um, series. Um, but it's beautiful. It, it, all it is is a MIDI interface. Um, and you hook it up to something that sounds nice and put that in front of someone who's never played a musical instrument. And they want to touch it 
because they, it looks really interesting. You say, well, if you push this pad, it will make this noise. And then suddenly, they're away. They're playing with something because it hasn't got that threat of, this is a musical instrument. Remember when you were at school and someone said, you've got to play the piano, and you hated it, a bit like you. <laughs> um, and I think that there is this whole thing of, can we design interfaces that don't threaten the user into being afraid of getting it wrong? being afraid of doing something that's not right, even though there aren't any wrong answers. Yeah, people still believe that there are, and that's really hard to get through. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, I have one question, <laughs> uh, but if you have some, I'll pass you the mic. So it's a question for Karim. Um, so at Algorithm, you went from um, desktop software to reinvent completely the experience on, on mobile. So what was this transition for you? Because I, I, th I think it would relate to many people here who may be tempted to go mobile. So wh wh how, how was the experience for you to go on mobile from desktop? So originally we saw it as a major opportunity because we had all the code already built um, for desktop devices. Um, so initially I think the challenge was making that work um, on mobile devices, um, which like back in 2010 were not as powerful as they were today. So we had to basically optimize a lot of our code that originally was designed for desktop and bring that to mobile. However, that whole transition I think allowed us then to reinvent our experience on desktop because now we had all this extra computing power and RAM that we could use for other things um, on the desktop. So we've continuously um, been in this mode of you know bringing something from desktop to mobile and then bringing those advancements back and not just on a technical side but also from you know interaction paradigms that we found uh, you know while reinventing reinventing our, our app for mobile we just found some things just worked so much better on a mobile device and we thought of okay what is the analogy on, on a desktop computer like how can we make that better and so we, we basically jump from one um, major platform to the other, and we continuously make the product better overall, and also try to think of ways how can we bridge the experiences together. So typically we don't ha have either the desktop user or the mobile user, but our users are usually both. So they use it on the desktop and the mobile space. So I think that, that's a major opportunity for developers because now um, you know you can basically sell the existing app to the same users again on, on a different platform. So um, I think it gives us a lot of um, you know, flexibility also to continue to dev the development and continue the innovation across um, desktop and mobile. So you're saying that your users are um, using both uh, the desktop and mobile platform. I guess it wasn't always the case. When you launched the, the mobile, did you, did you try to get users just for that? Or was it always uh, the intention to have users being able to do the same thing on both platforms? So we think users have both devices. So I, we, we always thought like, why would they not, when they use DJ on, on their computer, why would they not want to use it on their mobile device? Um, so we want to make the experience accessible to them wherever they are, like in whichever, on whichever device um, they're currently working on. So this gives our users a lot of flexibility to, to work you know, with our app um, regardless of where they are. Um, and we, we think you know, creativity is a lot about um, you know, being spontaneous and you have an idea, you wanna try it out quickly. So I think it's very important to allow users you know, to take out their phone and, and experiment with something and then later go to the desktop and then you know, um, create, create something with it. So um, we think it's very important for um, developers to bridge that experience because Nowadays, we think customers just expect it. Um, they, they don't expect to be locked out from using their um, product when they're on their mobile devices and vice versa. And again, it's a great opportunity because it offers different use cases. And we've also turned a lot of, we've converted a lot of mobile users that never even heard of, a, uh, of our desktop app. We converted those back to the desktop. So um, it, it's, it's a very powerful synergy between the two um, platforms. Thank you. Any more questions? This one so here. This question. do, do, we, do we have time? I guess. Yeah, we are through, but uh, maybe one last question. Um, so 
Yeah, I, I think uh, there was, there's been a bit of talk about platforms, and unfortunately, the mobile world has repeated like mistakes that were made in the desktop world to do with platforms. And I thought, you know, like there is a, there was a kind of platform in between that like, we're in the browser where you know it doesn't matter where you are, and there are some advances, quite a lot of advances in terms of web audio, where Things can be supported in different in in on all of operating systems with, without having to rewrite things multiple times and th these some of these problems. I know there's other limitations, but I'm interested to think to hear what the panel thinks if that's a viable solution and like where that's going and yeah, just your opinions on that. Well, there's, there's something interesting that um, we've done recently. We've launched um, a web version of our Launchpad app. Um, which is um, amazingly accessible on, on all platforms. And we've even added control for the hardware to connect to a Chrome browser. Um, and there's some exciting new updates for that coming up soon. So um, yeah, I think being involved in the web also is good. And I think the, the true answers there are to be on all of the relevant platforms, provided that you know, it's, um, it's relatively straightforward to do and doesn't necessarily cost the business too much in terms of lost opportunity elsewhere. But certainly for us, I think uh, being on the web also is important. And we also see it uh, at Smule. Well, it's something we're exploring because even when we explore um, web, uh, most of our users still access it through a mobile device. So you know, even if you're thinking you're developing for web, you still have to think that they're, they're probably using an iPad or a tablet or an iPhone through that to access that. that. So it's still mobile, but it's using the web technology. So it's something that we're exploring. We don't, um, the, we don't actually have any creation tools. The, comp uh, the uploading tool, we upload this on back and track that's on the web. But um, we have people ask us if we would bring Sing onto the web aspect. But in essence, they're still using it on a mobile device. That's so even if you're developing for the web, you have to think about it being accessed through, through, uh, through phone. And uh, I, I see in a lot of apps at yours, for example, that you both build your own web because you have the new stream and you have the, the possibility for users to, uh, to uh, yeah, give their productions into the web to the community uh, in, your dis in the gene. Uh, but, but you have also uh, it in your implemented into your app. So this makes a new form of network and uh, mobile web application. So, um, we come to an end of this little panel. Uh, if you want, you may come to us uh, later on. Um, thank you so much for being here. And yeah, that is for the panel for mobile music. <laughs>